Okay, welcome back to Green Plum Summit 2020, our very own reimagined digital customer conference. My name is Jacques Eistock, and I'm super pumped about our next two guests, Ashwin and Alex. They're here from deep in the bottles of R&D to talk about what's coming in Green Plum 7. You're not going to really want to miss this, so let's just kick it right off. Ashwin. Thank you, Jacques, for setting up this stage. So yeah, let's talk about what's coming in Green Plum 7. This session is a teaser about the next major Green Plum release. And I'm super excited to present this along with Alex. Let's uh, look at the next slide. One of the very exciting thing the team wants to present is that Green Plum 7 will be based on Postgres 12. And Postgres 12 is the current version of Postgres. So this is like major, major milestone Greenplum 7 will have. We have been across releases of Greenplum trying to reach the current of Postgres. And 7 will be the version where we will be shipping with Postgres 12. Now let's look at next slide, what that really means. So Post, uh, Greenplum 6 was on Postgres 9.4. So essentially, Postgres 12 has content corresponding to like five major Postgres versions. So 9.5 to 12, the features, enhancements, performance improvements, all the content will be available as part of Greenplum 7. And it takes quite a bit of work for the team to actually absorb the features and functionality provided in Green in Postgres, which is single node instance, to make them available as in massively parallel fashion in Greenplum. But that's what Greenplum 7 will be shipping with. And like this is this is very, very exciting time, which the team has. What this also allows us is like next set of features which we are building for Greenplum. We are trying to build along with the Postgres community. So the features which make sense for like single node Postgres and enhance those, we are working more collaboratively with Postgres community and developing those features which will be available in Postgres and in Greenplum together going forward. So that's like very, very exciting time and really looking forward for this release. Uh, what Alex and I would do is take you on a journey essentially to brief on some of the major features we will get in Greenplum 7. The feature list is really long. So what we are trying to do is take some subset of features and give you a deep dive on those features. Just before the Greenplum release, uh, we will do like deep dive sessions individually for each session and make them available. But this just gives you a brief idea of what's coming up in 7. So let's get started. If we move on to the next slide, the first feature I am excited to talk about is block range indexing. So next slide gives us why I'm excited about this feature. This is a new type of indexing, which will become available as part of Greenplum 7. What this index gives you is min-max uh, indexing type. So it's very similar to like creating an index using like B-tree or gist, it's in that realm of new index type. The major way it differentiates from the current indexes is that it, it's a metadata which keeps track of minimum and maximum values across a data range. What that helps out is it, it, it has very significant less footprint on disk compared to B3 indexes. Because this index is not tracking each and every tuple in the base table. It's across like range of tuples calculating min and max and that is what we are storing in the index. Because of that nature, it's very efficiently searches over a sorted amount of data. So if you have columns, which are inserting sorted data, creating BRIN index is very efficient on it. And also using that index, the searches are very, very efficient. This index type will be available for all the three uh, table types which we have. So it will be available for heap tables, AO columnar, and AO row tables. And uh, the, using the parameter pages per range, user can select how, what the range of uh, tuples it, it should be using to create the min and max for. So the lowest granularity is like one page, but if depending on the queries and depending on the size of the index, user can choose to have like 
uh, index created for like 10 pages or 15 pages, depending on how granular you want to create the index on. So on the next slide, starting with that, I'll try to showcase like how I played with this uh, functionality and how or what capabilities it brings on the table. So these are all the numbers and these are all the things which I played just on like my developer laptop. So these are like just to showcase the features which we are building right now. So for the setup, the table I'm using is going to be an append only columnar table and compressed with Z standard. Uh, what I inserted in the table, it's kind of like a sensor data, which effectively is like 100 million rows inserted into the table. And if we look at the next slide, if we create an index, if we create a B tree index and we create a Brin index, the time difference is huge. Like creating the B tree index is definitely much, much heavier compared to creating a Brin index on the same table with like that many number of rows. And next slide gives us idea that if we have the indexes created, if you have no index, definitely inserting the same amount like 100 million tuples is very, very efficient or fast. But if we have B3 index, definitely it affects the performance of load. Brain index gives you a midway where you can have an index and still load the data. It, it does affect compared to like having no index performance. But again, it's not as slow as having a B3 index. So it kind of like in between provides you capability of keeping the index and also loading the data efficiently. And when we move to the next slide, that provides you the biggest capability uh, which we have for the Brin index. So let's go look at the next slide. So here, what we see is the main differentiator, the disk footprint. So the actual table was like 796 MB, given it was columnar and compressed. But if you see, if you create a B tree index, since indexes are not compressed, the B tree index actually becomes much larger compared to the native table itself. And that is where the capability of like B tree index being efficient or not, or takes up too much disk space, Instead of that, creating a Brin index, the disk footprint is like really, really low. If you see like it's just 13 MB of index. But on the next slide, if we look at from the perspective of like execution, if we are running just query, the select query, which is what I'm trying to get like all the records for just February as a month, sequential scan takes like huge, huge amount of time. But the time difference between the the scan with B3 index or the time difference using the Brin index is not that much. And that provides like even with such a small disk footprint of Brin, you get much, much similar query performance efficiency similar to B3. So if you're trying to do like range queries like these, not doing like singleton lookups, Brin index comes very, very handy if you have sorted data. Now let's look at the next feature. And next feature I want to talk about is mostly like enhancements to vacuum thing. On uh, the next slide, vacuum is like one of the critical components uh, of the MVCC system. So Greenplum and Postgres both use MVCC and because of which uh, needs need for vacuuming exists where old tuples or disk space needs to be like reclaimed after doing aborts or after doing deletes on the uh, tables. The enhancements which are coming for vacuum are essentially on the in the realm of like reducing the disk IO and reducing the locking. And those are like very critical pieces because vacuum is like a maintenance activity and you want to keep its involvement or its disruption to the normal workload as minimum as possible. So the enhancements are coming from the perspective that like if you have tables which have been vacuumed and all the tuples have been freezed in past, rerunning the vacuum will completely skip out rescanning those pages. So that's a major improvement which helps like reduce the disk because they will not even read those pages and go through to figure out if anything needs to be more frozen or not. 
Also, enhancement has been done that even on lazy vacuum, at the end, we try to like truncate off what is the reclaim to reclaim space if we have all the empty blocks at end of the file. And to reclaim that space uh, had to take access exclusive log. So enhancements are again done to effectively remove that locking requirement and it would be like if we are able to acquire access exclusive lock we will take it and reclaim space but it will not wait to acquire those locks plus we are providing more options to the users like there would be option to choose if you want to do index cleanup or you want to like delay the index cleanup during vacuuming if you want to like have an option with the skipped logged that if run vacuum if you are able to acquire a lock on the table, perform vacuum on it. But if there is concurrent transaction running, which is having a lock on that, skip that table from vacuuming and move forward. So all those capabilities help you in a sense that it does not disrupt the, the workload running, but allows still the maintenance activity to be done on the system. And last thing to mention is vacuum DB will have like parallel option with dash dash jobs where one can specify how many parallel jobs you want to run for the vacuum, which also has option to like run with like you want to skip the tables which are already logged or not. So very happy to have those enhancements to help with having more maintenance on the green plum cluster. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, this is the feature which is from analytics side I'm really, really excited to share. So if you look at the next slide, what this feature provides is that normally when you do analyze on the table, the statistics which are collected are for single column statistics. But most of the times, the columns which are in the table do have correlated nature. And anytime you have correlated columns, running queries with correlated columns, planner will either underestimate or overestimate, and that creates like either bad plans or more usage of memory. So what the extended statistic feature provides is it allows the user to specify which columns are like correlated in the table. Let's take the simple example that you have a table which has city and which has zip code. Now, these two columns are actually correlated because if you know zip code, you already can figure out the city for that. So just having statistics for zip code column and statistics for city column does not help. So with this feature, if we as a user are able to provide that these two columns are correlated, it can create much, much better column statistics, which are cross-column statistics and help better estimate and better planning. So this feature is providing like three new capabilities uh, of providing statistics. So you can create now functional dependency statistics or multivariant and distinct counts across columns or even like most common values statistics combining two columns. And as we go through, I'll exp like help explain how this feature comes in very handy to make the planner better estimate things. So let's go to the next slide. And uh, for the setup to showcase or play around, what I have is a table, which is two column table. I inserted roughly like 30 million tuples in it. And as you can see the insertion pattern, the two columns are like correlated to each other. And I am creating an index on them, which is on both the columns, column one and column two. Now, if we just run analyze on this table, it will create statistics for column one and column two. And let's go to the next slide and look at it. If we have a query, something like this, which is using only single column in the where clause, uh, the number of rows planner is able to estimate is pretty accurate to the, what the actual number of rows we get. So both come out to be like 30,000 and the estimation was really good by the planner. But on the next slide, if we look at what we have is we have in where clause two columns, column one and column two. And as we specify two columns, which are correlated, 
what happens is then the estimation is very, very under the actual number of rows we get from the query. So the estimation is like we are going to get roughly only 33,000 versus actual number of rows which we get is 30,000. And what this affects is that in the plan previously we got is we got index only plan, but because of the underestimation, the planner picks heap scan with a uh, bitmap heap scan for this query. Now let's see how we can improve on the next slide. So what this feature provides is as a user, you can say create statistics. The type we are giving is creating a dependency statistics. If no argument is given, it will create all three types of statistics. We are saying create that statistics on column one and column two. So this is one time create command of statistics. After that, every time when you run analyze on this table, along with creating statistics for single column, it will also create stats for this dependency on the correlated columns. What it gives you the benefit is that if you see the same query we run after we created this stats, is that planner now is able to estimate again exactly very close to what the actual number of rows the query is going to return. And with that, we get back the index only scan plan, which we lost because the, stat the correlated status were not present. So that's where this comes in really, really handy as a new feature. On the next slide, I'll give example of instead of if you are doing a group by. So in case of group by, again, if you are doing group by on like two columns, which are correlated to each other, the planner actually very, very overestimates how many rows we are getting. So it's like heavily overestimating the number of rows compared to what we get. Like we are only getting like thousand rows, but it overestimates that we are going to get like 99,000 rows. And one of the impact of that overestimation is that since we are using hash aggregate, it considers that that many bucket we will need. So it allocates a memory corresponding to that much number of rows are going to return. So we see that it's kind of taking like 3000 K of memory to run this query. If we look at the next slide, what that tells us is if we create the indistinct type of extended statistics between column one and column two. Again, in group by case, the number of rows estimated comes very, very close to the actual number of rows. And what that is giving us is that the memory footprint for the query drops down drastically so that it's using only like 97K compared to like 3000K of memory. So that's where like this extended statistic feature really comes in handy. It cannot be then automatically and like user need to provide this information because the collecting these stats is like extra work the analyze needs to done. So in cases where it helps is where like user knows best. And that's the reason user has to create these stats and analyze does not like automatically create these stats for the user. So let's move on to the next slide. Uh, the last kind of feature which I am interested in showcasing is absurd. So the next slide gives you an idea of the problem which exists currently that if you have a table and have a unique index on it, which has some data in the table. And if you start some transaction, and if in that transaction, certain values violate any constraint. So we are taking example of like unique constraint. So values one comma two is violating the unique constraint present on the index present on the table. So even if one value is like violating the constraint, the whole transaction gets aborted. And even the values which we wanted to insert like three comma three is errored out. And the bigger impact is the whole transaction is rolled back. So suppose this was part of like much, much bigger transaction, the whole transaction gets lost. As a user, it would be helpful if we can like not error out the transaction, but have some other capabilities to do. And that is what this absurd feature allows you. So next slide, what this feature provides the capability is as a user, you can say that on conflict, do nothing. So effectively you can say, 
ignore the rows which are conflicting, but let the transaction move forward and not error out and let the rows which are not conflicting be still make to the table. So in this example, what happens is one comma two, which conflicts is ignored, but three comma three row gets inserted into the table. Now, there could be other option which as a user you would prefer. So if you look at the next slide, instead of doing nothing as a So I'm going to continue to talk about a few more other interesting features in Guntam 7. And I'll start from just-in-time compilation. So just-in-time compilation, or JIT, is the process of turning some form of interpreted program evaluation into native program and doing so at runtime. So if we look at the following queries as examples, where A equals to three, select B and select the sum of C, those are arbitrary expressions that get evaluated at runtime. So in the interpreted fashion, these expressions are evaluated by some general purpose functions that are usually, that usually have a lot of unpredictable branches and function calls. With JIT, we can compile these specific operations into more optimized functions that would execute much less instructions and indirect jumps. And obviously this will help a JIDA program to perform much faster than its interpreted counterpart. And sometimes a JIDA program may even outperform an ahead of time compiled program because the compiler knows more information during runtime and can do more optimizations. So enough introduction, let's look at the JIT implementation in Postgres in the next slide. So by default, Postgres uses LLVM to perform JIT. And currently the JIT operations include expression evaluation and tuple deforming. The expressions could be in a where clause, a target list, uh, aggregates, or projections, et cetera. Tuple deforming also almost happens all the time when we need to get the, the attribute values out of the physical tuples. And there are also inlining and extra optimizations that can be performed on the, the generated code. Now let's look at when do we use JIT in the next slide. So the typical queries that would benefit from JIT are the long-running CPU bound queries. The decision of whether or not to JIT is cost-based and is made at plan time. So if the cost is too low, obviously JIT won't be necessary because it would probably introduce more compilation overhead than the runtime benefits it brings. And there are gaps that specifies the lowest cost that trigger different JIT operations. For example, if the cost is greater than JIT above cost, then we'll perform um, JIT on expression evaluations and tuple deforming. If the cost is above JIT inline above cost, then we'll do um, extra inline optimization. And same for JIT op op optimize above cost. Um, so we'll play with, uh, we'll play more with this gap in an example in the next slide. So to play with JIT for starters, we use the TPCH query number one, which is known as a good JIT candidate. And here's the setup. We create a table line item. We copy some data from a generated file into this table, um, which is about 60, 60 million rows. And then we analyze the table. And then for the query, as you can see, it has a lot of expressions and aggregates and it only scans one table. Now in the next slide, we run explain analyze with different combinations of JIT options controlled by the three GUGs that we mentioned previously. So for all the three GUGs, zero or any value above zero means perform this JIT option if the cost is above this value and minus one is a special value for disabling the option. For example, here, JIT all means all JIT options are enforced, and no JIT means all JIT options are disabled. In the next slide, here's a example of the explain analyze output. As you can see from the bottom in the JIT section, um, we have JIT we have JIT compiled 
six functions. And for the JIT options, we have inline, um, optimization, and expression evaluation, table deforming all enabled. And if you look at the cost on the top of this query plan, which I have in bold, it is the value is actually greater than the default values for all the three GUX. So even if we didn't set the GUX, we'll have um, all those JIT options performed. In the next slide, we can see the execution times for different JIT options. The top bar is no JIT and the bottom bar is JIT all. And as you can see, the performance gain is nearly 40%, which is really nice. And I think another good thing here is that because JIT is cost-based, the optimizer makes the decision for you. As users, you will just get the performance gain in this case. So this is JIT. And now let's move on to the partition tables. In Gwynplum 7, the partitioning engine is replaced with the upstream Postgres implementation. That means all of the related catalog tables and internal data structures are new. For users, most of the existing syntaxes remain with the, with the addition of the new syntaxes from upstream. And I'll show you some of the new syntaxes here. Um, let's see create table. Say we're creating a root partition table part, which is partitioned by range and then subpartitioned by list. With the new syntax, we can first create table part by range with zero partitions. And then for the first level range partitions, we can say create table um, partition of four values form two. And then for the second level partitions, we can say create table partition of four values in. And with this new syntax, you may have noticed that um, the partitions are treated as first class tables. For example, part one, part part P1, part P2 are independent table names, not aliases. A partition table can also have zero partitions and the partition tables can have heterogeneous hierarchy. Um, and well, you'll see what I mean by heterogeneous in the next slide. Attach and detach partitions are two um, very useful new syntaxes. Say we create another partition, partition table, part new, that is partitioned by range with two partitions. And then we can say alter table part attach partition part new for values um, and then specify the, the part bound, boundaries. And then we can also say alter table part detach partition. And now if we do a backslash D plus on the root table part, you can see it has two children, part new and part P1 with their partition bounds. Similarly, we can get the table descriptions for part P1 and part new. And notice that part P1, part P new, and part new um, as siblings in the same partitioning hierarchy are partitioned by different partition strategies. One is by range, partition P1 is partitioned by range, and then partition, sorry, partition, uh, part P1 is partitioned by list and then part new is partitioned by range. And this is not allowed in the previous versions of Greenplum, and this is what I meant by heterogeneous hierarchy. And now um, let's move on to the next slide, and here's more examples of how to map the existing syntaxes um, with the new syntaxes. We've talked about create table, and there are a couple of alter table operations like add partition, um, truncate partition, drop partition, rename partition. Um, these are all pretty straightforward. We can just now simply perform the same operations on the partitions directly. And then for exchange and split partition, it looks like it looks a little complicated and they're also still under development and discussion. Um, but I think the point is that for most cases, attach and detach partition are really what you want rather than exchange and split partitions. Um, let's go to the next slide and and I'll talk about so these are the three catalog tables that stores that store information about partitioning PG partition table, GP partition template and then we have three new fields 
in the PG class table. And we'll look at an example of what they look like in the next two slides. And here are three useful built-in functions that show information about partition tree, partition root, and partition ancestors of a table. And in the next slide, we can have a little taste of what's in the catalog tables. So in this query, we can find out whether a table, if you look at the result, um, we can see uh, whether a table is a parent, whether it is a child, what's the partition strategy, and what are the partition keys and partition bounds the table covers. And next slide. We will also support hash partitioning as a new partition strategy. And um, if you are curious, hash partitioning is particularly useful to maintain a controllable number of partitions and to decide uh, to divide data evenly among all the partitions. So in this example, we created three hash partitions. And as you can see, the row counts numbers are pretty close um, among all the three partitions. And I think this is all I have for partition table. Now we can move on to um, table access method interface. The table AM interface, or sometimes called pluggable storage API, is introduced in Postgres 12. It is a nice abstraction that separates the execution engine and the storage layer. We'll next take a look at how Wimplum leverages this interface for the append optimized tables. While there are different storage layouts and access patterns for tables and various indexes, for tables in Gwynplum, we always have heap tables and append optimized tables. And the append optimized tables can be further categorized as row oriented and column oriented tables. In Gwynplum 7, as you can see from the PGAM catalog table, AO row and AO column now appear as two separate table access methods. Now we can um, create the pan optimized tables with the new syntax using AO row or using AO column. You can also specify the default table access method to AO column, AO row, or heap. And in the next slide, here's another example of creating a, an append optimized table with, exp with compression. If we can, as you can see um, from the table description, AO column is the, is the access method and compression type and level remain as the relation option. And next, let's move on. This is the last feature I'm gonna talk about, which is um, store procedures with transaction management. So create procedure, my procedure, and call my procedure is now an alternative of creating a function that returns void. It also brings the possibility of performing commit or rollback transactions inside of a store procedure. And in the next slide, we'll look at a use case. Say we have a large table and we want to create a procedure that has a for loop. And then in each iteration, we insert a lot of data into the table and do some work with it. For example, we may use the table for some cool machine learning algorithms, and then we truncate the table when the work is done for this iteration. And now let's compare how we write this procedure in Gunpam 6 and 7 in the next slide. And there are really not much differences between the two pieces of code, apart from changing the names from function and select function to procedure and call procedure. Um, the only, well, the most important difference in, is that in GPDB7, we added this one line, plpy.commit, which is not supported in GPDB6. And with this ability to commit inside of a procedure, we can reclaim the, this space that is allocated for the truncated table immediately after we finish using it at the end of each iteration, which otherwise can only be reclaimed at the end of the entire procedure call. So this is that, and if we go to the next slide. Um, for the time being today, I can only cover a small selection of 
new features in Boom Pump 7, um, but there are really a lot of new exciting features out there. And with that, this is the end of my talk. Um, I'll hand it over to Jock or Ashman if he's available again. Thank you so much, Alex and Ashwin. Uh, Ashwin, I know you had a, a, a slight blip as you were talking about upserts. Um, do you want to give a, a quick 30 second, um, you know, kind of conclusion of that for everyone? Sure. So the 30 second conclusion for upsert is that it effectively allows as a user to on conflicts convert inserts to updates and not like error out the transaction. So that's a very great capability, especially with like a database where we are loading huge amounts of data, single row or something, doesn't abort the whole transaction or whole data loading. Awesome. Well, I appreciate both you and Alex coming and giving us a prelude of what's coming to Green Plum 7. I was excited before you got into the details, but I, I don't think I'm alone in saying now I'm super excited. So thanks again.